والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Bismillah, alhamdulillah, and welcome to this episode of the Beauties of Islam. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and I'd like to continue talking about one of the beauties of Islam called preservation. Allah tells us in the Quran that it is He who preserves this Quran, and He uses the word hafiz. Hafiz means to uh, preserve, and we say hafiz Quran is someone who memorizes the Quran, but actually they're preserving the Quran. We've been talking about preservation of the Quran. We talked about the preservation of the Sunnah or the Hadith of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now we'd like to discuss another type of preservation, and that is the teachings of the scholars of Islam who came after Muhammad, who understood his teachings and passed it on to their generations and subsequent generations after them. But as always, we begin by saying, Bismillah. In the name of Allah. One of the uh, early groups would, are called uh, the companions or Sahabi. These are people who knew Muhammad personally. They had met him. They accepted Islam during his lifetime. And they lived and died as Muslims. And they had heard from him something that could be verified that for sure they heard it and then they could pass that on to next generations. And this is the beginning of the transmission of both the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, because we've mentioned many times in other programs, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never wrote a single thing. He did not write it down. How we know it to be authentic is because it all matches. There's not even a word difference in the Quran and there are many rawayas or sources to show us the different teachings that he gave. And again, they're exactly the same thing. <clears throat> now, I want us to reflect for a minute on those companions, those people who were teaching this information to the next generation. Now, these would be people who never actually met Muhammad, peace be upon him, but they had definitely met these scholars and these teachers who had met him. They're called Tabi. The Tabi are the people who are the companions of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. peace be upon him. After these people are their generation, the next generation from them, they are people who now are meeting people who had met the companions. Therefore, they're called Tabi, Tabi'in, or companions of the companions of the companions, if you will. About these people, the Prophet Muhammad prophesied, peace be upon him. He prophesied that the best of the people would be those who are of his companions of the day. The next, or the best, or reliable, would be those who came after them. That, again, is the tabi. Then after them would be the tabi tabi'in. Now we understand that these are the best, and after them the best, and after them the best. But then after that would be regular people, normal people who could make mistakes and so on up until the last days. And then there would be another group of people in the very end who would really understand this message and convey it to each other. <clears throat> and it's even mentioned in the big speech, the famous speech called the Khutbah the Wada of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when all of the companions had gathered together on Arafat and he delivered this famous sermon called the... Uh, farewell sermon. What he did was to explain basically the principles of what Islam is teaching us and be sure that the people understood it's about how we worship God without partners, our treatment of our mothers and fathers, our treatment of our wives and how we have to be so careful to give everybody their rights. He talked also though about something that is kind of amazing when you think about it. He talked about races of people and mentioned that no race of people would have any advantage over another race. And not according to Islam. Regardless of your skin color or your ethnicity or the country that you come from, in the sight of Allah, 
you're all the same. Now, this was 1,400 years b before we start talking about segregation, separation between the uh, black people, white people, looking down upon somebody, maybe they're from the Orient as opposed to somebody who's Arab and so on. So this teaching is, uh, I think, amazing. And then look what he says at the end of this teaching, though. He said, it is hoped that those that hear it today will convey it to those who are not here today. And those who hear it at the end will understand it better than those who are here today. That's an amazing statement when you consider what he's talking about. <laughs> because he's seeing that the people in front of him right there need to get out and share this message with the people who are not there, but the people who hear it at the end are going to understand it even better than the people there. Well, today, it is amazing when you think about it. We today have, of course, we have the whole Quran. That was preserved even at his time. Many people memorized it. But we have it in written form, which they didn't have at the time of Muhammad. It wasn't completely written down as it was at the time of his death. Now, there's a lot about this. So what I want to do is take a break here, give you a chance to think about what I'm talking about. Maybe you'd like to get a pencil, paper, make some notes, make note of our website. All that's coming up. So stay right there. Don't leave. We're going to be right back with more of the beauties of Islam. Islam is keeping up the pace. Islam is for every race. Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورت للقرآن ترتينا. Learning how to recite the Quran properly. Learning the meaning of what we recite. Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite. Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life. We we'll listen to the participants and the guests. We'll take your phone calls. We're going to recite life. We'll listen to your recitation. And we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which we'll state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. Will come true. In Alhamdulillah, we're back and you're watching the beauties of Islam. And just when we went to break, I was talking about how the Quran is preserved, how the Hadiths are preserved, and how the teachings of the scholars are preserved. Now, what I was saying is that even at the time of Muhammad, they didn't run around with books in their hands like we have today. The Quran was not compiled in book form like you see this. It was all written down, by the way, on such things as scrolls, and animal hides, palm leaves, things like this. But the Quran itself, gathered together as a book, didn't happen during the lifetime of Muhammad, peace be upon him. This came about at a later date. And yet, even then, it was not considered to be right until they would check it against the memories of so many of these companions who had totally memorized the Quran. And, of course, they all agreed exactly point for point, dot for dot, how it is because they had all memorized it. It wasn't something they had to worry about making up later. In fact, it's been said many times, if out of all of the books on earth, that we had lost all of the books on earth, that the Quran is the only book on earth that we could bring back exactly as it was, word for word, letter for letter, and dot for dot because of the preservation in the memories of so many different people around the planet. <clears throat> Bismillah. Now, I want to mention, too, that when these teachers and scholars went out to teach, they didn't consider themselves to be scholars of Islam. That wasn't even their aim. That was not their goal to set up shop somewhere and say, hey, I'm a teacher, I'm setting up a university over here, and, you know, you can come and get your Islam from me. As a matter of fact, what did happen is that so many new people, there was a big influx of new people entering into Islam 
in large numbers. This is mentioned in the Quran. They entered into Islam at Waja in big numbers, huge numbers. Thousands of people came. So there would be certain ones who had done a lot of extensive work along with memorizing the Quran and so on in learning and teaching what had been brought by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These people all had jobs. All of them had work that they did, and then they would do this on the side. In other words, the teaching of the Arabic to those who were not Arabs, the teachings of the Quran and the memory work, and the preservation of the Hadith or the sayings of Muhammad, all of this was done on the side because these people were having different businesses and different jobs that they did and didn't consider that this is something that people needed to be paid for. After all, they were really believers in Islam and they understood that this is a more than just a ritual, it's an obligation, it's a right that a Muslim has to get knowledge and it's the responsibility of the other Muslims to teach them and that's what they did. Now we've talked also in our programs about the four schools of fiqh which is Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa. I want you to be sure to understand that these people never set up shop across the street from each other and had competition of university or uh, academies or schools trying to get people to join them. That was not the case. First of all, they were very much remote from each other, for the most part. The first in the succession was Imam Abu Hanifa. And in fact, he knew companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Therefore, he was considered a tabi, because he had met some of the companions of Prophet Muhammad. That means he was in the generation considered the best after the companions. And he was a great and wonderful teacher. He lived in Basra, which is quite a ways from the Arab Peninsula. Then the next one in succession is the Imam Malik. Now, he lived in Medina, and he was the great scholar of Medina. That's the place where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is buried. Imam Malik met and shared information with Imam Abu Hanifa. Therefore, for sure we know that Imam Malik is a tabi tabi'in because he met a companion of the companions. What's interesting now is that we find that Imam Shafi happens to be a student of who? Of Imam Abu Hanifa. How? Because he was a student of Imam Malik and Imam Malik sent him to learn from Abu Hanifa's students and so he went and journeyed to Basra and learned from Yaqub, Abu Yusuf, and Muhammad ibn Hassan. In fact, he even lived with Muhammad ibn Hassan and studied with him. He was the great judge and Qadi at that time of the, uh, what was known as the school of fiqh of the Hanafiya from Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, if that's not enough, the last and final one we talk about is the Hanbali fiqh or Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and he was a student of Imam Shafi. So therefore, we can say immediately that none of them were having these great differences of opinions that you might see today from some less educated Muslims, we'll say. But in fact, they all agreed on the most important principles, which is that there's only one God, La ilaha illallah. Muhammad is his last and final messenger, Muhammad Rasulullah. The Qur'an is the haq, the absolute truth, and is preserved as we know it to be without any doubt in it. And that all of the hadith, now all of these imams said this, all of these hadith, if they're authentic, then that is my way, that's my madhab, that's what I understand. So please, if you know any Muslims have a problem with this, talk to them about this. Let them see this program by going to our website. It's called beautiesofislam.com and you'll find replays of these programs and others right there and get more information about the beauties of Islam. Oh, we've run out of time. We must go now, but go check out our website and come back here for more Beauties of Islam. Till next time, Assalamu Alaikum. Islam is peace.